This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 114, recorded December 31st, 2010. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and it's time to talk about viruses for the last time in 2010. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts is Alan Dove. Pleasure to be here. You're back in your fort there after making a trip south, right? Yeah, yeah, I went down to visit the in-laws uh, for Christmas and then came on back up here. Did you get back before the snow or afterwards? Right before it. Well, you're, very, yeah, we, you're very lucky. We left there uh, first thing in the morning in order to avoid it. Yeah. We got 18 inches down here in New York. Oh, man. We only got about 10 up here. The city was paralyzed. And yeah, that's been quite in the news. I had a friend who went to a concert on Sunday, and he could not leave. He sat in his car all night until 7 a.m. Monday, stuck on a highway somewhere. <laughs> because the he said the, the fire trucks, the sanitation trucks were all getting stuck, and nobody could clear anything. It was a mess, so you got away. However, down in Florida where Rich Condit is, I'm sure there's no snow. Hey, Rich. 74 degrees, uh, a <laughs> few clouds in the sky. Actually, it's been pretty cold lately, but it's uh, warm back up. It's very nice. Very nice. Well, that's it. You're in the right place. But you, well, you I'm paid in the right place dues. this time of year, yeah. You paid your dues. I did. In Buffalo. I did that. Yep. I, I heard that already up in that snow belt they've had over 60 inches of snow this year. It uh, wouldn't surprise me. It starts in, what, October or something like that? Yep. Wouldn't surprise me. Well, here it is, just a few hours left in 2010. And uh, so we thought we would talk about 10 stories from the year that we like for one reason or another. And uh, we did 50 TWIV episodes in 2010. That's pretty good. Almost every week, except for two somewhere. We did three road trips, ASV in Bozeman, Munich, Germany, and Florida Gulf Coast University. I counted something like 21 guests. Wow. Which is great. Excellent. Get different voices in here. And, of course, we don't want to forget about the hundreds and hundreds of emails that we continue to get. We had four episodes devoted entirely to email. And, we'll have uh, to have another one soon, too, because we're building a backlog. Yeah, well, I think we should do one probably in January. It would yeah. be good. Because we do have a backlog, and uh, they continue to come in. Terrific emails, and I wish I could do them all uh, in one show, but th there are a lot of ones. So we thank everybody for that, because without those emails, the show would be very different. I think the ca I was listening to a podcast the other day, and... The fellow was saying the real key to having a good podcast is engaging your listeners. Absolutely. And I think we engage our listeners, or they engage us better than any other podcast. Yeah, the email really drives a lot of the discussion. It's great. I mean, we can tell we have a community out there, and they're engaged and connected, and they ask great questions. So it doesn't matter how many there are. It's the engagement, and we, I think we win in that sense. So here are 10 stories, no particular order, and we're not saying they're the best. They're just things we picked out and thought we'd go back over again and make some comments on. And the first one we just talked about last time, and that is XMRV, chronic fatigue syndrome, and prostate cancer, which we talked about on no less than one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different TWIV episodes. Yeah, when did that first show up? So I did a, a PubMed search for XMRV. The first paper is 2006, the original paper where it was detected in prostate tumors. And the most recent is a paper from the WPI by Mikovits et al. There are a total of 85 citations. And not all of them having to do with sequences in patients. Some of them are basic studies on the replication of the virus and culture. Others are peripheral, but... Uh, that's not too bad, 85. Yeah, it's uh, a that, very active did area. You, did you just you search just for XMRV? Yes, I put that, that those letters in, XMRV and to uh, I'm, so, I'm a little surprised there wasn't more than that. You know, there's been a lot of, uh, lot of activity. But I guess most of it's very recent. Yeah, I, I, I don't know if that's the best way to do it, but um, 
it's always a quick way in my book. Uh-huh. Let's do it again. XMRV. You get uh, 85, which includes four reviews. Well, also bear in mind there's a lot of work going on that hasn't necessarily been published yet. Right. Yeah, there is a lot of work which is unpublished, but we don't typically talk about that because I don't know what to make of it for the most part. Right. A peer review isn't perfect, but it's like democracy. It's the best that we have. <laughs> right. So this this whole thing seems to me was, I mean, kind of simmering uh, from the initial description of the association with prostate cancer from 2006, but it seems to me that when when chronic fatigue syndrome came into the picture, that's when it really kind of exploded. Yeah, and in fact, uh, most of the news attention has been on that. Yeah, uh-huh. that's true. Um, if you look at the, there there have been just a few stories about the prostate cancer connection, and that really has, has not drawn a whole lot of attention. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and actually looking at the results from prostate cancer, I mean, there's maybe even more confusion there than there is with CFS. It's a, it's a very, very peculiar um, set of findings. It's hard to know what to make of them. Um, so I, I think there, there just, there hasn't been nearly as much coverage of that, even though that's where it was first discovered. Yeah. I said, someone asked me that recently and I said, people just don't care about prostate cancer. It's an old, well, it's an old man's disease, and yeah, it's uh, it's uh, that's that's interesting. I th- people are people are used to hearing about and dealing with prostate cancer. There are a lot of treatments. Okay, it's a it's a pretty known quantity, and yeah, exactly. You know how to diagnose it first of all. It's very yeah, right. It's a it's a definitive. There's not a lot of question. Well, actually, the the available tests are a little. There's the issue of false positives, and there are some controversies in it, but there. But it's not um, it's not as ill defined as CFS. Yeah, apparently the PSA test has improved early detection, right? To the point where you can pick it up before it's too late, and then you can treat it. So that's good. Uh, so it has a very different aura around it than chronic fatigue syndrome, which is still searching for an etiology. Um, and as we've said before, if the virus turns out to be the cause, then that will facilitate diagnosis, which is what we have for prostate cancer. My sense, too, at least from my own personal experience through this uh, podcast with uh, CFS, is that there's a very um, robust advocacy group for CFS. Sure. Yes. That, and and and. I, I wonder. It seems to me that th- that their reaction to all of this may have uh, helped drive some of this, and, and maybe they're getting some of what they would like, which is more research. You know? Yeah, I, I agree. They're very vocal. They have forums. They have a network. Uh, when we do something, they appear on the comments. Mm-hmm. Right. And uh, that does not hurt. Absolutely not. Right. And there's no analogous uh, thing for prostate cancer. No. Right. I, don't, I don't know that you need one, right? No, because prostate cancer is high on the uh, on the health system's radar. Um, people know what to look for. They know how, as as we've already discussed, how to diagnose the uh, diagnose it. There there are treatments. CFS is um, a different sort of issue. We uh, I think we said last year on this review, the, the stories of two thousand nine. I think we said that it would be sorted out in 2010. Yes. <laughs> did we? I prob- I'll bet we did. I didn't go back and check, but I have a suspicion that we did. And Well, I'm not going to say it's going to be sorted out in 2011. It actually has taken longer than I would have guessed, but some science is that way. It doesn't always go quickly. And uh, here it's been a, l- a little more difficult, and there have been a lot of technical issues involved. Yeah, so the bottom on, on the initial studies, I kind of expected that there would be you know, a, a rapid uh, coalescence around a, a reliable set of assays, and then, you know, we'd get data very quickly about uh, how many people are infected and in what groups, and, and that would pretty much settle the issue. Because right. um, I remember we, we did talk about it in, uh, in our 2009 recap, and I, and I think we did kind of suggest that it would be <laughs> sorted out yeah. quickly, but yeah. obviously that's not turned out to be the case. Well, I think the, co- the amount of coverage we've given is... is um warranted because here a potentially new human pathogen and i think it would be great if to have covered it from the beginning 
Sure. And whatever the course may be, we're going to follow it. So, And um, if it turns out not to be, that's also, you know, worth covering from the beginning because uh, there are, there are these types of results in science too. Sure. Right. The process is important. Oh, actually, exactly. That's it. Exactly. We're following this process and we can go through the whole thing and then look back on it, whatever the answer is. So where we stand now is uh, uh, there's a lot of studies, some drawing an association between XMRV and either prostate cancer and CFS, some drawing a blank in that regard. And I think where we left off last time is that uh, we need a standardized set of assays and multiple assays so that everybody can be doing appropriate tests and exchanging samples and sort out this mess. Right. And my guess is that we will make significant progress on that uh, during the next year. Right, and a very careful set of controls because yep. we now know that it is it is stunningly easy to get um, false uh, positives. Some, various, some false positives in this. And I think the IAP assay that Alan Ryan talked about is important to incorporate. Yeah. To ensure you don't have murine nucleic acids present. The as everyone knows, we've talked about there is a the FDA has a blood safety working group, which is tasked to sorting out the assays to uh, to. to to be developed that would be used to diagnose infection. And there's a study headed by Ian Lipkin, which is comparing samples given to different groups to see uh, how reproducibly the positives and negatives are, are arrived at. So I think in the next year, we should know that study certainly won't go longer than another year. It's already in the FDA blood safety group study is in phase three already out of four. So I think we should know within the first six months of this next year uh, how that's all worked out. And then the point is then you can go forward with these assays and start looking in larger populations at, at the presence of the virus. Right, if you've determined that you can get consistent results. Yeah, assuming that you can do that. Because that's what that, that's what that um, experiment is, is really yeah. asking, is can we get consistent results from different labs using yeah. uniform procedures? And it's probably worth wrapping up this discussion with a quote from the most recent XMRP, XMRV paper from the WPI. They say, we advocate the use of more than one type of assay in order to determine the frequency of XMRV infection in patient cohorts in future studies of the relevance of XMRV to human disease. Here, here. So there you go, the first group to make an association, they are still cautious uh, in their public statements. Second story, the ongoing saga of polio eradication, which we talked about at least twice, I believe. And we shouldn't minimize this. This is a big deal. And we, I guess sometimes we ignore it because it's been going on for so long that um, we're always sighing. So the WHO had originally decided to eradicate polio by 2000, which is a goal that we've long passed. Uh, and if you go over to polioeradication.org, they have a very nice summary of the current status. Um, year to date 2009, there were 1,531 cases of paralytic polio. And year to date 2010, 908, so about half as many. The interesting number is there are four countries where polio is endemic and has never been eradicated, Nigeria, Pakistan, Afghanistan, and India. And the total cases in those countries in 2009 was 1,199, and so far this year, 221. So we have significantly reduced the number of cases in these endemic countries. The problem is the number's gone up in the non-endemic countries. There have been outbreaks in Tajikistan and the Congo, as we spoke about. And so that number is 687 this year as opposed to 332 in 2009. Any thoughts on eradication of polio? Will it happen? Should, we, should we be doing it at all? I th I have thought for a number of years, as you know, that this is uh, a noble goal, but probably a poor use of resources. Um, focusing the all this attention on eradication of polio. I mean, yeah, we'd like to get rid of this disease, but I I think it distracts from 
other health goals that a lot of poor countries really ought to have. And I think that um, an awful lot of money has been poured down this hole and, uh, and it keeps not being done. Why is it so hard to do? Well, because the you know the the last point point one percent or whatever we're down to is um, is just these are some really tough nuts to crack. I mean, the countries you just listed, it is uh, with the possible exception of India, um, the logistics of doing anything in in a place like uh, Nigeria or Afghanistan it, are just um, nightmarish. Yeah. <clears throat> so, what's the difference really between eradication and control okay I mean if you if you say okay well uh, eradication is an unrealistic goal then what do you do because obviously you want to control it um, right I think I think the um, the sales pitch for eradication has always been well look if we eradicate this disease then we can stop vaccinating and then we save all that money that we were spending on vaccine uh -huh. um, the problem is that the upfront costs of getting through the eradication, if you can even do it, are immense. And while you're funneling all that money into there, um, I mean, people, people really hate to admit this, but the truth is global public health is more or less a zero-sum game. Um, there's not a flexible pot of money here. There's, there's a set amount of contributions coming into this sort of activity. And um, if you're spending it on polio eradication, then it means you're not spending it on um, uh, well child visits in third world countries, and you're not spending it on measles vaccine, and you know you're, you're directing the funds in this particular place. Um, whereas with a with a goal of controlling it, where you say, okay, polio is one of the vaccine preventable diseases we want to, uh, yeah, wipe out long term, but really we want to just have um, an infrastructure in place to deliver vaccines, to prevent these diseases, to prevent polio, measles, mumps, rubella, diphtheria, pertussis, tetanus, tetanus yada, 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 on down the list. Um, and then you can place, instead of uh, doing these national immunization days where you go and you immunize everybody all at once with just polio vaccine, um, then instead put the money into building and and maintaining the rural clinics that would be necessary for an ongoing type of uh, um, of preventive health care. Reminds me of a, of an article I read recently that was a, a report on a meeting where they evaluated the first five years of the uh, uh, Gates Foundation funding of uh, wildly innovative projects. Uh, and a, a major goal of that was to come up with uh, vaccines uh, that didn't require refrigeration mm -hmm. so right. that they could be uh, transported. And uh, they were, I mean, one of the bottom lines on this report was that they were somewhat chagrined at the lack of pro uh, progress. Uh, Gates himself said that we were overly optimistic. Mm -hmm. yeah. But yeah. the interesting thing was that the the report said that they'd actually managed to make um, good candidates uh, for vaccines that previously required refrigeration and these would not. But what they figured out was that one is not enough. You have to have them all uh, all of the vaccines available in a fashion that doesn't need refrigeration because as long as any one of them does, you still need the cold chain. Right. Yeah, sure. Okay? And it's kind of what you're talking about, Alan. If you put all of your eggs into one basket and you still don't have the infrastructure in place, uh, you you got a problem. Let's ad address the infrastructure first and the rest will fall into place as public health improves. Right. I must say that with the outbreaks and stuff that keep coming along, uh, the goal of eradication does look pretty slippery. You know? Well, it's hard to predict, but the, I think the Congo outbreak that we talked about recently is a good example. There you have lapses in immunization. You cannot just keep immunizing everyone in all these countries. There are sufficient numbers of disruptions that you don't do that. Eventually you get non-immune people getting to rather advanced ages and then once you then the virus is introduced into the population and you have big outbreaks of serious polio 
So you have to keep immunizing huge numbers of people. And I don't know that the money is just there to do that. And it's not a science question, but if you can't immunize everybody all the time, you're going to have a hard time with polio. Right. Having said all that, I think it's important to note that there are a lot of private foundations who've really, uh, the Rotary in particular, oh, uh, yeah, put a lot absolutely. of effort and money in this, and they're to be congratulated for that uh, humanitarian effort. That's yeah. and, and whether um, the effort succeeds in eradicating the virus or not, I think uh, the, the Rotarians um, deserve huge props for making enormous progress against yep. it. Yeah. And that's not nothing, you know. Yep. They, millions of people around the world can walk because of, of all these vaccination campaigns and that's uh, that's huge progress so i don't think we can predict what will happen this year but i'll bet it's not eradicated in 2011 whether it ever is who knows it's too hard to predict but not going to happen this year and i would predict that there will be more outbreaks likely unfortunately i don't want there to be but uh, i think it's a bio biological fact that that's what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, we'll keep an eye on it. We will. Number three, the interaction of viruses with the microRNA siRNA system. Did a couple of twibs on this one. An early one was on a great episode called Bucket of Bolts, where yeah. we talked about two papers where people... So what happens in many cells, viruses infect the cell... And the cell chops up the viral genome to small uh, RNAs, siRNAs. And the two papers we talked about, they could actually sequence the total siRNAs in the cell and identify the viruses that had infected them. I don't know if either of you guys remember that, but that was yeah, really I do. cool. They were plant viruses, I believe. But the idea that, that you have this history of infection is a, remarkable. And then yeah. we ex actually extended it to prokaryotes where we talked about the CRISPR system where there's a, a memory of infection in the, in, in the way of sequences. So viruses or plasmids that get into bacteria are recorded by a sequence that gets inserted into genomic DNA. And that in some way targets the next virus for destruction. So that was one way. And then uh, the Stites paper that we talked about right. was another right. cool uh, way that viruses do interact with that system. So where the that was a um, what was it herpes simuri mm -hmm. mm -hmm. turned out made small RNAs that were complementary to micro RNAs right and by modulating then the activity of the micro RNAs in infected cells uh, indirectly modulated host uh, gene expression to presumably create an environment uh, more conducive for replication of the virus amazing what I, yeah and what I what I thought was also cool about these stories is, you know, the, the Myrna Cerna system was just discovered a few years ago. And it's this huge dimension of gene regulation that we were completely blind to. We didn't even know this existed. And then somebody found it in, in C. elegans in worms, basic research project. And, and the thinking then was, um, oh, well, that's just some freakish thing that worms do. Um, and now it turns out to be in everything in in uh throughout life and uh and it's this massively important system and then you turn around and of course immediately find or or very shortly thereafter find that viruses are already you know tapped into this system and right. and they are as deeply enmeshed in it as the cell is they either make microRNAs themselves or make anti microRNAs so right. the whole thing going on I think this is going to be a big deal for the next five, ten years. Mm -hmm. I think we have a lot to learn, and yep. we're going to learn what these small RNAs do in cells and how viruses manipulate them, and then we're going to use them to deal with virus infections. I was looking quickly at PubMed to find some recent stuff, and I found one article where they're trying to use adeno-associated viruses to deliver genes to the central nervous system. But these viruses also infect other tissues, and they don't like that. So what they do is they put microRNA targets in the virus, in the viral vector genome, and so the virus doesn't replicate anywhere except in the CNS. I think that's just absolutely Isn't that cool? Excellent. So you, you, cool. you find a liver-specific microRNA, you put the target in the viral genome, and the virus doesn't replicate there. 
That's so that, cool. awesome. That targeting these vectors has been a, a real problem for a long time. People working on different receptor biologies right. and kind of right. stuff. This is another way to do it that's really uh, nice, yeah. absolutely brilliant. Well, and because microRNAs are very short, it's uh, it's much easier to insert those into a virus than to go monkeying around with its yeah. receptor. Right. It's much easier. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I found another paper where they put a microRNA into a flavivirus genome, and it changes the virulence of the virus. Right. So you can do a lot of things with these, and this is just the tip, I think. Right. We may see vaccines where the virus is attenuated by uh, making it uh, susceptible to knocked down by microRNAs in the cells. That's amazing. Sure. Yeah. And I wonder, Alan, you point out that microRNAs were a fairly uh, new deal, and now they're a whole new uh, world uh, in biology. I wonder what else is still out there that we haven't discovered yet. Exactly. You know? Probably a lot. Yeah. And it's right in front of us. Right in front of yes. us. We, we we're, we're, I'm sure there's stuff that we're looking at, that we people can, are looking yeah. at right now and saying, oh, yeah, that's just some trivial thing. Sure. We say that, you know, only 1% of the genome is coding and the rest is junk. Maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> Story number four, endogenous viruses and paleovirology. This is something that really caught me by surprise and really exploded, I think, in this past year. Mm -hmm. So an endogenous virus is a virus which whose genetic information is integrated in the germline. So it's passed on from uh, parent to offspring. So the, the only ones we used to know about were retroviruses that did this. RNA viruses that make a DNA copy that gets integrated into DNA. If it goes into the germline, it's called an endogenous virus. So the first one, I think it was earlier this year, that we discussed uh, was the uh, integration of bornavirus nucleic acid into cells. And bornaviruses have negative stranded RNA genomes. And these integrated sequences were found in people and non human primates, rodents, elephants. And when you find such sequences in the genome, which you do mainly by bioinformat bioinformatic analysis, you can then use it as a clock. And you can go back in, in the phylogenetic tree and ask, where are these sequences and how far back can you trace them? And for the Bornas, you could use that to say they're 40 million years old right. at least. First time outside of retroviruses being able to uh, put a, a number on the age of viruses. Now, for the retroviruses, the DNA intermediate and integration of the DNA intermediate is a normal part of the life cycle. So yeah. uh, th they do that very efficiently. There's lots of uh, copies in lots of different organisms, so that's fairly easy to trace. The Bornavirus and these others that uh, we came up with or that arose uh, during the year don't make a DNA intermediate. And we, we wondered a lot about, well, what's this all about? The Bornavirus, as I recall, our excuse for that being uh, in the nucleus or, or making a DNA copy in the nucleus was that the virus has a nuclear phase. Is that right? Even though it's yeah. an RNA virus. Right. right. So we figured, well, maybe it could be fortuitously reverse transcribed and, um, and that could uh, get integrated. But some of these other viruses that we came up with uh, don't even have a nuclear phase. So it looks like... You know, cells aren't perfect. They're sloppy. You can get some reverse transcription now and then and uh, integration of these viruses, their sequences into the genome. And they, so they leave a, uh, a record. Mm -hmm. Right. And you could imagine maybe some cell at some point was co-infected with um, a, a retrovirus and mm -hmm. some other virus. And then, hey, while well, you got the reverse transcriptase floating around, you go ahead and make a, accidentally make a DNA copy of one of these other viruses, and uh, and that gets popped in there. Mm -hmm. Could be, or it could be, you know, cells do have reverse transcriptase. Right. Encoding genes, and it could be that as well. Um, but it's accidental, and it's usually not the entire genome for right. all these viruses, with the exception right. of retros. So they're curiosities mainly. Whether they have advantages for the cell is a good question, which I think people will be looking at in the next year. And to what extent have these impacted evolution? Exactly. Well, they're certainly interesting because uh, as a paleological record, 
because we've said many times, you know, viruses don't leave fossils, but that turns out not to be true. Right. These, yeah. are, these are in, in, in some respects, uh, virus fossils from very long ago. Yeah. I think for now that is the, the best use of this material is that we can use them as fossils, whether or not they're of a value, we'll see. Aside from the Bornos, uh, the phyloviruses were found to be endogenous. Uh, hepatinoviruses, hepatitis B viruses, right. circoviruses, parvoviruses, bunyaviruses, rhabdoviruses, influenza viruses, rheoviruses, and flaviviruses. Wow, I didn't realize the list was that long. Yeah, yeah a, f a number of papers came out, some in the past few months, where... I mean, these guys, they just do bioinformatic study, and they, they pull them out. So my question is, there's still some viruses missing from this list. Are they in there and we haven't found them yet? Got to be. I mean, that list is so so extensive with so many different virus biologies there that uh, it's hard to believe that if you look hard enough, you won't find the rest of them. Somewhere. Would you expect to find pox viruses? I was just wondering the same thing. Sure, I'd be kind why of not? surprised not to. Yeah, why not? It's a DNA virus. It's in, it's in there. It's uh, how how could you never yeah, have any kind of right? So maybe we'll see that next year as these computers are fired up and cranking away. Uh, so that's very interesting. I that was to me a big surprise. I did oh, yeah. not expect to see all of these viruses as endogenous viruses. Right. No. When the when we talked about the first one, the I guess it was the Borna virus story. It was just wow. Yeah. That that is. Uh, that was out of left field. And then they just kept coming. Yeah, because then everybody, of course, went to the databases and uh, yeah. started pulling out even more. Story number five, dengue virus progress and a new outbreak. We had a couple of episodes, three episodes on dengue. And uh, there was, of course, an outbreak in the Keys, the Florida Keys, which we originally discussed on a TWIV, and then we went down to Florida Gulf Coast University and spoke with the guys who try and limit the mosquitoes there and therefore the spread of dengue. Um, I, um, I think, as you know, and we've said dengue is the most common vector-borne viral disease in the world. It's of huge potential ser significance, so there's a lot of research going on. And one of the big goals is to make a vaccine. And uh, I have a colleague, Rosa Maria Del Angel, who we, who we did a TWIV with in Mexico, uh, who organized a dengue meeting in Cancun. And she sent me this summary some time ago. Today, the results of a phase one, two, or three of nine different vaccine candidates were presented in the second Pan American Dengue Research Meeting in Cancun. The, vac the candidate vaccines include Sanofi, Pasteur, NIH, Envirogen, Fiocruz, Caroline Vaccine Institute, Merck, and GSK. The vaccine candidates include attenuated strains, yellow fever virus containing dengue virus structural proteins, DNA vaccines. Venezuelan equine encephalitis vector expressing dengue proteins as well as recombinant proteins. Discussion includes topics related to efficacy, protection, and antibody response, correlates of protection. Two main concerns are the absence of an animal model and the standard methodology to test the vaccine efficacy that can be reproducible in different labs. Now, we actually that talked about one um, mouse model. Um, I guess that was on TWIV82. That's right, or, for serious disease, right? Yeah. You give the mice dengue plus antibodies and you get the, the more serious disease. And there's also a model for the um, non, not serious disease, the dengue fever. So uh, I don't know why they're worried well, about it. Well, I, but I don't think either model is great or perfect. Um, so the the question may be, um, can people settle on an animal model that's good enough to do uh, initial trials? Because as we've mentioned with dengue, the big fear in developing a vaccine is that you're going to go and vaccinate people and then you'll end up predisposing them to yeah. uh, to yeah. the more severe form of the disease because it's a case where uh, where a little immunity is worse than none. That's right. It's a big problem. It is. Yeah. And so as you can see, there's a lot of effort. Right. Yeah, and, and yes. with other with other viruses, um, you know, if you if you have a vaccine that's partially efficacious, well, that's a partial victory. With dengue, it's it would be a complete disaster. Right. 
So this is going to be a big area of activity in the next year, I think. Um, I'm uh, very interested to see whether this incursion into uh, the southern United States in Florida is yeah. actually going to continue as, uh, or will uh, die out. Um, the mosquito guys down in Florida were, uh, I thought, uh, pretty cautious. They were, I wouldn't say necessarily apprehensive, but um, they didn't seem to think that this was just a one-time deal. Right. But they uh, they were on their guard for uh, more episodes of this. Well, and it was interesting that the uh, the Key West Mosquito Control Program is really, it seemed like it was kind of its own thing. Yes. Uh, all by itself there in Key West, and they were commenting on how Miami doesn't really have an analogous capacity. Uh, but they certainly have an analogous climate that supports the mosquitoes, and and you could easily imagine if the virus gets out of Key West or essentially out of the Keys, um, it could maintain transmission. Sure. Yeah, that was one of the most interesting things to me about that particular episode was the the discovery that the Key West Mosquito Control uh, Organization existed for the purpose of tourism. Yes. Right. Uh, their primary their primary goal was not public health necessarily, but to get rid of the mosquitoes to so the tourists would uh, stick around. It was economy, and yet it's going to turn out, I think, that their methods and their vigilance uh, are they're going to be the go-to people um, in mosquito control and controlling uh, the the disease at the level of vector. Um, should this continue in Florida? Yeah, yeah. that was an eye opener. Very interesting. Yeah, so, I, when I actually, I, when I saw their, uh, the existence of them, I, I just presumed that, oh, well, I guess every county has something like that. Or, yeah, uh, I figured I was paying for it. Right. I figured, oh, it must be like the Agricultural Extension Services where there's well, one everywhere and you just don't think about them. But in fact, they are, uh, from what I gather, unique. So this is another one we'll follow and we'll uh, mm -hmm. see if some of these vaccines start going to trials. I, I also, I wasn't, before this, I wasn't really aware of just how prominent dengue is uh, as a disease worldwide. And I suppose this is becoming, it's become more and more a problem in the in the last few uh, decades. But yes, um, yes. It, it, it's a serious issue. Oh, yeah. And we will follow it for sure in 2011 and beyond. Story number six, Colony Collapse Disorder. Here's, I don't even know why this is so interesting, but it is. It's very it's fascinating. It's <laughs> yeah, we had talked about it in two twenty nine, two thousand and nine. Yes. And the idea of trying to find a virus that was associated with it. And there were a few studies of of trying to do that and there were some virus candidates. But this year we we pulled up a story, a Twiv one oh four, where they found that it, prop, it correlated with colony collapse disorder of honeybees correlated with having a iridovirus and a microsporidian together. Right. I don't know if you guys remember that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. These are, yeah. The, where the, these are the viruses that make the uh, insects colored. Right, the iridoviruses. The iridoviruses. And this was a collaboration between some people at a university. Where was it? Was it Michigan? Uh, I, I kind of forget. And... Uh, and an, an army outfit. Montana. That, yeah. Montana. Oh, Montana, that's right. Yeah. And an army outfit that were good at um, mass spectrometry. That's right. And they, uh, I loved the methods. They ground up bees. They made a bee extract <laughs> yes. uh, and ran it bulk through the mass spectrometer and looked for anything new, any sort of protein signature news. Fantastic. Yeah, I think this is a good one. And we'll see now whether this uh, holds up because now people have the tools. They say, okay, look for these two agents and see what you get. This commentary you came up with, uh, Vincent, however, is very interesting as well. Uh, yes, very sobering. Yeah, it's, it's a sense. short letter in um, bioessays. And they basically say, you know, bees, honeybees are really important. And there are a lot of ways that they get sick, not just colony collapse, right? Yeah, and I thought it was interesting. They say, they cite a survey where um, beekeepers in the U.S. I think um, ranked colony collapse disorder as uh, something like the eighth biggest right. cause of of colony mortality, and there were a bunch of others uh, above that that uh, you know were were much more mundane sounding. Yeah, I think they uh, blame the press for a lot of the um, imbalance on getting attention to colony collapse. 
And this letter is meant to say, hey, there are other things too. CCC well, is important, but let's look at the others as well. However, in the process, uh, in the process of advertising, if you like, colony collapse, the uh, public awareness of the importance of bees is raised. And yeah. that's good. Dramatically. I think yes. it's important, yeah. I like the statistic here. Although most of humanity relies upon foods that do not require animal pollination, production of 39 of the world's 57 most important monoculture crops still benefits from this ecosystem service. And Western honeybees are the single most valuable animal pollinators. Uh, it's an important issue, and uh, it's not answered yet. I mean, this is one paper, as we have said before, it's not enough. It's tantalizing, but others will now have to come and follow through. Right. You can't just rush out and, and come up with treatments for irritovirus and say you solve the problem because we don't know that that is the problem. Yeah. A matter of fact, one of the things that was missing in that paper was that they themselves mm -hmm. acknowledged is that they haven't actually isolated the candidate virus that right. Right. causes this. And I'm very interested uh, to see if they can do that and to uh, see what that virus looks like and what it does. Yeah, this will be fun to follow. We'll get some yep. of these... Uh, people on the show as soon as things happen yeah i think we have a few leads for who to talk to that'll be and fun. also also to find out if that's you know you you have to do as we've talked about with other viruses you, you have to do the hard work of figuring out whether it's causal or just an opportunistic infection right, right. story number seven david baltimore we had him on to celebrate twiv 100 yeah so that was a big deal twiv 100 absolutely but i think also he's still a big deal Yes. Yeah. He's a, such a smart guy. He's, it was a I great was kind conversation. Of, I was kind of walking around, wow, <laughs> for a week or so after that show, just to, to hear the, the history, Yeah, you know, to hear his whole story was fascinating. Uh, to me, one of the fascinating things was when I asked him what was the, you know, the biggest paradigm shift that he had witnessed in his career. And he immediately went went back to the very beginning and he said you know it was messenger rna yeah. and that was actually before my time and it's hard to put yourself into that frame of mind and and realize wow what an insight messenger rna would have been yeah yeah he's terrific he's got a great perspective he's been around a long time yep. he's brilliant and i have had the i had the honor to work with him which is really cool so uh, i'm grateful for that but I think we have to remember we have these terrific virologists around and they know a lot. Yeah. And we should t we should go to them and talk to them and that that conversation was an example. Great conversation. He loves talking about viruses. He loves viruses. All we have to do is say, "Hey, David Baltimore, you want to talk about viruses?" Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Turn on the recorder and you can learn a lot. That was terrific. So that And he just he just happened to be in Columbia. When TWIV 100 came up, it was meant to be. Meant to be, for sure. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, you couldn't plan it with a guy like that. So that was one of our top stories. Number eight, Ode to a Plaque. When I tell people about TWIV, <laughs> I tell them to listen to this one, okay? <laughs> I just love this story because I love plaques, right? Yeah. And uh, this, among other things, had that uh, uh, video micrograph of a plaque growing that we all which just went, still wow, blows my it. mind yes that's that is just one of the coolest videos i have ever seen and, and i use it in my lectures and so this was about uh this was about how pox viruses make plaques and it uh the bottom line of this was that the viruses emerging from an infected cell emerge on these stalks that go sort of feel around for an uninfected cell. They can't infect an infected cell because of super infection exclusion. And uh, if they find an infected cell, they're actually passed ahead on the similar stalks from that cell until they find an uninfected cell. So they surf on this wave of these stalks that are made in front of the plaque and help the plaque grow. It's just a fascinating, uh, very basic science piece of work. Great stuff. And I yeah. love when we were discussing it and Alan was watching these movies. Yes. <laughs> and I couldn't stop. I just he, kept playing the video over asked, We asked him a question. He said, what? What? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's beautiful. I would like to know if anyone's doing this with other viruses, and if we're going to see that in the coming 
Yeah. I hope so. I do too. Because it'd be very, you know, I can't believe that other viruses don't have some sort of mechanisms uh, to enhance spread that could be revealed by similar types of assays. Yeah, apart from the the really cool visuals that it produced, there there are good reasons to look for these simil- these mechanisms in other viruses. Um, mm-hmm. You know, is that the is that the general phenomenon, or is that a, a special pox thing? Yeah, I think that you're going to find differences. So just look at some other viruses. Right. I'll bet you'll find things that enhance spread. So in terms of the end result, they're similar, but yeah. mechanistically completely different. Yeah. Now, just last week, a paper came out from Lynn Enquist's group where they did a wonderful study uh, labeling pseudorabies virus or herpes virus with three different fluorescent colors. And it's sort of a similar thing, but not the same. And their question was, when you infect a cell with multiple viruses, how many actually replicate? Hmm. All right. So we're go- I think we can do that on our next TWIV. Okay. Because it, it just came out. And the answer is surprising. And the reason Don't tell for me. That, Don't tell me. We're not going to tell you now. We're going to okay. leave it at that. But we'll do it for, for our next TWIV. All right. Same idea, using labeled viruses to get new insights into replication. Uh, story number nine, vaccine contamination with circovirus. This is a this story is, that emerged and then went away, didn't it? Yeah, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's very interesting because people just sort of, uh, in the long run, accepted the FDA's spin on this and said, okay, fine. Yeah. There's a virus, of, a pig virus, a circovirus, a single-stranded DNA virus present in two different rotavirus vaccines made by different manufacturers. That was detected by Eric Delwart uh, by sequencing and microarray, basically. And the FDA said, hmm, we'll see if this is a problem. They suspended use of the vaccines for a while, and then they said there's no evidence that this is a problem. Uh, there's no evidence that there's infectious virus present. Uh, and you can go ahead and take these these va- vaccines. And as far as I know, they're not going to change the production to avoid incorporation of this contaminant, which I think ar- arises from trypsin used uh, in the preparation of the cells. Trypsin is the poor well, It'll be interesting organism. to see what happens with that. I, um, I would have thought that they would, you know, be retooling the production to try and get uh, PCV-free cell lines or whatever so that they can make stocks that do not have this stuff in it. But we'll Well, see. the problem is if you retool production on a vaccine or a drug, you have to reapprove it. Yeah. And that's not a small matter. Right. Um, so it took a, took a long time to develop a good rotavirus vaccine. And this is a vaccine that we want, and we want it to work. Uh, and it's it's good for public health to have the vaccine, and so I think the FDA has has had to weigh uh, risks and benefits here, and with no known risk from the presence of the virus and significant known benefit from the use of the vaccine, um, it probably makes sense to just continue. I like the way this story developed on TWIV, too. It reminds me to some extent of the... Uh last year with the pandemic flu where it first showed up almost as breaking news right Mm -hmm. right it was an abstract or a news release or something like that that said that this had happened with no details we didn't know the methods or anything else just that a contaminant had been uh, found in some uh, vaccines and then the paper came up and on a subsequent episode we discussed the paper and then Vincent and I just happened to be in San Francisco, and Vincent <laughs> mm-hmm. arranged uh, to talk with the author of the paper. It's a it's an interesting uh, development of the series on TWIV. Actually, I think we can do that. We have a weekly frequency, mm-hmm. right? So right. we can st- cover stories in a breaking way, but we can also give a perspective that few else can, right? Right. Cause yeah, and are- our, focus, our focus is narrow enough that we can loop back around to something like this and cover it on multiple shows without worrying that, oh, you know, we only have 60 seconds to devote to right. medicine. Um, so, but we can, we can instead go and dig into the story and, and get at what's really going yeah, on. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. 
We can also do a whole bunch of stuff wrong and then come back later and sure. correct our mistakes. Yes, that's true, too. <laughs> yeah, this is no one's paying us, I suppose. <laughs> I talked to a reporter the other day, and she said uh, she just discovered TWIV, and she wanted to listen to the last episode, and she said, oh, I said... 75 minutes of talking about viruses. I don't know if I could take that. And then she said she listened to it, and before she knew it, it was over, and it was great. <laughs> she said it was really interesting. I said, well, oh, that's good. I'm glad you like that. But that's, I said, I think it's because it's a conversation, in fact, mm-hmm. and right. not a stodgy lecture where we just talk about what we think about these things. If we make mistakes, we come back and fix them. And quite often the listeners weigh in as well. Yep. So this was an example of that kind of story. Yeah, it broke early on. I remember um, walking along the street here, and, and Ian Lipkin said, something's happening, but I can't tell you what it is. <laughs> and Great. I went in, in my office, I Googled something that he had given me, and I found it immediately uh, online. And then Eric Delwart actually sent us his manuscript before it was published. So he ended up publishing this in the Journal of Virology. He found that the circovirus contamination was the major contaminant in about 10 different human viral vaccines. Uh, and that's been the end of it since then. And there is a nice summary on the FDA website, which uh, I will post a link to so you can see all the proclamations they've made. There's even a video of the from the director, Margaret Hamburg, talking about this as well. And that seems to be the end of it as of now. Although, you know, considering our conversation last week with about XMRV and the extent of contamination of MLVs in various biological materials, I'm surprised that there aren't MLVs in human vaccines. Uh, You sound so sure about that. Yeah, well, Eric had a pretty comprehensive study of 10 different human viral vaccines. He didn't find it. Hmm. He actually just sent him off an email before the show asking him about that. So we'll see what he has to say. Well, the other thing we talked about relevant to this was whether this would have any impact on how vaccines are safety tested uh, or evaluated. Quality control was done yeah, before they're released. Yeah. And whether deep sequencing would become a, a routine matter on lots of vaccine. Right. And that remains to be seen. I actually put up a poll uh, after our TWIV 77. Do you want to know what's in your vaccine? Okay. So let's see what the results were. 329 people answered, yes, I think deep sequencing should be done in all biological products. No, I don't care what's in them. So 94% yes, 6% no. So clearly people would like to know what is in their vaccines of the 300 who responded. Yeah, I think if it's um, if it's feasible to look for stuff, we should know as much as we can about our vaccines. Um but I think we're going to find, as these techniques get more and more sensitive, and we're now to the level where you can detect uh, less than one virus per cell, and um, and, I, and I think we're probably going to see more of these sorts of things where we, we didn't know it was there and it hasn't done anybody mm-hmm. any harm, and now you find out it is, and it's still not doing anybody any I harm. I think that this study probably is the first to, it probably gave impetus to the whole idea of checking everything by deep sequences or microarray right. analysis. Yeah, and so you're going to have more of this in, produ- in a production environment. And the yeah, and I think, I think this will probably become standard for companies that are developing new vaccines. Right. Um, the sequencing is... I'm sorry, Alan, go ahead. No, go ahead. I mean, obviously, you'd rather not have anything that you don't know about in there. The sequencing is going to become so cheap and sure. so easy that there's uh, uh, before too long, there's going to be no reason not to do it. Right. Speaking of sequencing, you remember the Pacific uh, technology? Pacific Biosciences. So yeah. I sent that link to my wife, who's at Merck. Uh-huh. And she said, oh, I know a guy who works there. Why don't you get him on your podcast? Ooh, good so idea. So I said, yeah, ask him. So we're going to try and get one of these guys from Great. Pacific, just if anything, to tell us how this works and right. uh, what it can be used for. So that'll be fun. And speaking of vaccines, that brings us to story number 10, universal influenza vaccines. Wouldn't it be great if you got one flu shot when you were like a year old and that would be it the rest of your life? I always thought that was a pipe dream. But this year there was actually, uh, there were results from several labs that suggested that it might be possible. And we talked about that on TWIV 107. Um, The Blasey Group 
has found that if you immunize with the stem of the hemagglutinin, you can get broadly neutralizing antibodies made. And Gary Nabel's group at the NIH has found that if you use a prime boost strategy, you come in with a DNA vaccine followed by a vectored hemagglutinin, you can also get broadly neutralizing antibodies. I was really surprised at this. I thought this was way off in the future. But it's pretty close, I think. It's just a matter of tweaking this to get it to work. And I think this is a reality. Well, yeah, that would be real, really interesting to see that develop. I think those results were much better than, than I would have expected to see. They Absolutely. were very, very yeah. impressive. It was very good. So I think that's an important finding, and I think going forward we're going to hear a lot more about that. And that is great because, you know, getting a flu shot every year is really logistically a problem. Yes. And people just don't like it. It's the one vaccine that I think you have a lot of resistance to simply because of the high frequency. And it's a a financial burden. I mean, often the patients don't have to pay, but uh, uh, I learned just a little while ago most pediatric practices lose money on um on flu vaccines every year Mm. and most pediatric practices are not really in a position where they can afford to lose money so it's a it's a big expense um just because reimbursement rates are so low and it's a as you said a huge logistical issue and then a pandemic comes along and you have all that added on top of it um yeah so yeah that's something we'd like to do away with vincent when we were talking about uh, dengue earlier uh, in this broadcast, um, your letter from Rosa said that the main concerns about the developing a dengue vaccine were the absence of animal models and a standard methodology to test the vaccine efficiency that can be reproducible in different lab- laboratories. What's now you're talking about a completely novel, really, flu vaccine? Um, are there appropriate animal models and a standard methodology to test the vaccine? Yeah, for flu, there is actually. There's a good uh, you can use mice, or you can use ferrets to test vaccines. And in fact, in these papers, they used both. You can even use non-human primates. So you okay. have three different animal models that you can use before you think about going into people. All right. So uh, with flu, you're, we're really set to go. Okay. And so the other thing that came up in my mind, at least, uh, was this idea that if you've got a vaccine that's not quite good enough, you could run into the problems that we've seen before, uh, like with dengue, where uh, some immunity is worse than no immunity at all. Oh, yeah, actually. Do you remember we had a, we did a a paper just a few weeks ago, which showed that a lot of the severe H1N1 vaccine um, pneumonia disease was a consequence of low affinity or non-neutralizing antibodies that had accumulated after right. many, many years of right. influenza. So yeah, you could make a vaccine that would do that. It would be a problem. It's almost like they ought to have some sort of an animal model that can reproduce that phenomenon and make sure that the vaccine that you're producing isn't going to do the same thing. Yeah, I think I would think you could do that. You could you know, immunize animals to produce non-neutralizing antibodies and then come in with a different virus and Right. You should get serious disease. But yeah, I would guess you should look at that before you go into people. Is that well, and when problem? you do go into people, you can also do some fairly sophisticated um, analyses of their own of their antibody profiles. Right. Um, so you you do your initial phase one and two clinical trials. You make sure the vaccine's safe, and you take uh, blood samples from all those patients post immunization and see what those antibodies will neutralize and if they are binding but non-neutralizing on any viruses. Yes, absolutely. That would be really important. Yeah, Because then you you've do, got the result from humans. Yep. Can you do human trials where you actually challenge them with virus, or do you have to just let them go into the world and keep an eye on them? Yeah, you have to let them go in the world. With flu, you have to, yeah, that's, I don't believe that, unless they're already immunized, which in this case would be self-defeating. Right. Yeah, you have to let them go in and you look at the rate of infection. Yeah, the phase the phase three on that would be a huge community community trial multi center thing where you um, uh, you you immunize thousands and thousands of people and because you're looking for a comparatively rare event and then keep track of them. You keep track of them. You follow up with them. If they develop a cold, you uh, determine what it is and uh, and follow them through the season and see what proportion of them versus what proportion of your controls because obviously you have controls. Um, developed uh, influenza. 
I can't imagine running a study where you have to keep track of people. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah, it's hard. That is, that is, is one of the biggest expenses in a clinical trial. It takes a long time to set up the trial, and you have to have really good ways to track people. But you do lose some along the way. Always. Yeah. Yeah. You always do. Well, let's do some email. Uh, the first is from Gene, who writes... I am at present suffering from what I have been told will be a virus. Symptoms. A dry, continuous, hacking cough, unable to get much sleep. No cough medicine seems to soothe it. Uncontrolled loss of urine when coughing. Otherwise, no flu symptoms. History. I harvested 12 rows of potatoes, some of which were scabby, five days before the onset of these symptoms. Could there be a connection to the Adean potato model virus, which you state is a plant virus of the family Comoviridae? Any comments would be most helpful. Now, I don't know if this is a serious email or not. Nevertheless, it is somewhat instructive to go over it. Because, first of all, who said it would be a virus? <laughs> the first sentence, I've been told right. it will be a virus. Uh, so you either know or you don't know that there is a virus there. It, has to be, it can be isolated from you and identified, but... From the symptoms alone, you can't really say that. I think lots of times, however, when you go to a a doctor, if the doctor looks at you and they don't have any explanation yeah. from it, then for it, they're liable to say it's a virus. Right. Or, or likely, likely to be a virus. Right. Or if they did a throat culture and it came back negative. Right. Uh, yeah. You know, they uh, it, you don't appear to have any serious bacterial disease, so you probably have a virus. Viruses get blamed when you can't find any other reason. Now, with, the, with good justification. The symptoms, of course, could be due to a common cold virus infection or could be due to other things as well. Mm -hmm. um, Bacterial infections? Could be. We'll do that kind of thing. Sure. Now, the fact that you harvested potatoes just before doesn't mean anything. This is a common trap that we all fall into, you know, causation versus association, which we talk about all the time here. So just because you harvested potatoes, which may or may not have had a virus in them, bears nothing upon your illness. To really connect, if you wanted to know whether a DN potato model virus causes human illness, you would have to do a very, very large case control study. And since there's no evidence for such an association of this virus with human disease, that really wouldn't be warranted. And I would say also that the likelihood that a plant virus is going to cause human disease is really low. I can't think of any examples uh, of such a thing, at least in my uh, experience. There's no evidence, really. I don't know if you remember, Alan, we did a, a show, Red Hot Chili Viruses. Yes. <laughs> it was ah, a study right. out of France where they found that people, yep. who, people who ate spicy foods were excreting a lot of plant viruses, but you know, there's no evidence that those caused any disease at all. Well, I think in this case, it's important to get uh, plenty of rest, keep your roots well watered, <laughs> um, and uh, you, you either need a tablespoon of honey or some fertilizer. There you go. Yeah, I think you... Uh, you just Alan, have, you should have been a physician. You, should, <laughs> you have to be careful. You can't make these associations. People do this all the time, and that's where viruses get in trouble. You know, my child got a vaccine and then developed autism a month later. It's the right. same kind of thing. You can't make those conclusions from you these, need to these know data. you need to know the denominator. You need yeah. to know how many um, how many people have gotten this cold and how many people have harvested potatoes and is this a you know is this a coincidence? And also right. five days would be kind of a long incubation period for most cold viruses, I think. Uh, this idea of interspecies transmission of a pathogen too, I think is a really uh, interesting concept. We've talked about a number of different situations where interspecies transmission of a pathogen is important either in, uh, you know, disease like hantavirus infections or Ebola virus infections or something like that, um, or in evolution of viruses. But I think it's important to understand that it's a pretty rare thing. We interact with all kinds of species all the time, and they're all crawling with viruses. Uh, and the number of times that we pick up a virus uh, from another species that actually replicates us and causes a problem is, it's very, very rare. And I can't think of any examples of transmission of a plant virus to humans. 
Sophie writes, hello to all the great TWIV hosts and guests. I found this story and find it quite intriguing, but I really want your opinion on the matter. Will it work when they only vaccinate the high-risk kids? And if they use the attenuated vaccine, I don't know if the dead vaccine also is an oral drop vaccine, will the risk of the vaccine strain regaining pathogenicity and infecting the non-vaccinated kids or adults be high? So she sent a link to a story from the WHO, Africa seizes chance against polio. I believe this was from October this year. And they were going to do a massive immunization campaign to reach 72 million children, focusing on uh, high-risk children in areas considered at highest risk of polio transmission. So she wants to know if that's a good idea to do that. Well, it's since that time, uh, since that time we've had uh, outbreaks in Africa, right? Yeah, since then we've had outbreaks in the Congo and some cases in Nigeria. Typically, you do target the highest risk individuals because you can't hit everyone. You just, mm -hmm. it's not feasible. So you have to make decisions. And you you usually can control the spread by targeting such areas. So historically, it's it's been shown to work. So it's not a bad strategy. The only problem is when you don't immunize everyone, the ones you don't immunize may end up getting infected later on. Not necessarily, but they could. If they use the attenuated vaccine, will the risk of vaccine strain regaining pathogenicity be high? Yes, it is quite high, as we know. The, the dead or the inactivated vaccine, as you call it, uh, Sophie, has to be injected. So that's why it's not used for these, the eradication campaign, because it's much, much more costly to do that. But yes, when you would give the attenuated strain, it reverts in the gut and it can spread in the population and cause polio. And that has happened in Africa. I would really like you to get the veterinarian who wrote last week on. That would be great. I can't. I can hear we're a bit behind the U.S. on that field. It's still recommended to get your dog vaccinated once a year in Denmark. And don't you worry, I still love the show, of course. Uh, she's talking about a vet who wrote to us, chiding us about our criticism of. Ah, uh, yes. Member veterinary right. immunization yes. practices. Uh, I would like to get that vet on the show, in fact, to talk about veterinary viral vaccines. And yeah, and she made a really good point, which, um, for those who missed the show, um, was that uh, a lot of these veterinary vaccines, there's just not the money to do the kinds of studies and look for the long-term immunity that you would have, uh, that you'd have the money to do if you were uh, working on a human vaccine. Right. Um, so they call for vaccination every year, and uh, I, I think I uh, snarkily commented that, well, they need to make money. But the uh, <clears throat> the real reason is that they, they tell people to get their dog or cat vaccinated annually with a lot of these vaccines because they don't have reliable data that the vaccine would last longer right. than that. I would, I'm going to go back in our notes and dig up the email of that vet and see if we can get her on the show, Sophie. Great. That'd be fun. Next one is from Anna Maria. Good morning. I truly enjoy listening to your podcast and often find myself laughing out loud at some of the jokes. Oh, my God. Yeah. She, so said, she said some, not all of them. Okay. I am a graduate student currently working on my thesis. Unfortunately, I seem to be in the common position of most students. I need more data. As I was searching through the plethora of information out there, I had an idea. Well, a question, really. Is there anything out there for scientific papers that resembles Wikipedia. Let me see if I can explain this properly. If there was a website where members could post their current work, negative data, or even papers that were rejected for various reasons, then other members could go in, look at the work, maybe comment. This would be an opportunity to get feedback on your work, also a way to see what other people had done. For example, I'm currently looking to see if certain proteins are packaged in a retrovirus. It would be nice to be able to see if others had already tried looking for these proteins and had been unsuccessful. It would also be nice to see if there are better methods for purifying virus other than the one I'm using. When we read articles on various topics in our lab, we tend to tear them apart, as my advisor likes to put it. But all that work that we put into trying to understand the paper and finding flaws in some of the reasoning is lost as soon as we leave the lab. In my opinion, it would be amazing if we could go and give feedback on papers or current research 
where the writers or even other members would be able to see. It would also be amazing if we could ask questions. I don't know if this would be good for some of the larger institutions, but amongst the smaller ones, it would be a way to communicate with your peers. My husband, who is a computer programmer, tells me this is completely doable in terms of programming. The only problem he sees with it is how it would be paid for. Servers cost money. My only concern is as competitive as some science gets, people sometimes people would not want to share, but I think it has been shown how much more information can be generated when you share. So is there anything like that out there? And if not, who would I talk to about trying to start it? My initial thought on seeing this was it's called PLOS One. Um, and uh, you followed up with a comment, Vince, but <laughs> I'll let you take that in a moment. But PLOS One is the Public Library of Science set this thing up um, a year or two ago, I think. And uh, it has a very low barrier to entry for papers. They essentially review them to to see that they're, you know, competent and not completely insane. And, um, and then they put them online. And there's a commenting system where, uh, so they are, they are peer reviewed in the sense of being checked for the basic stuff and making sure that they make sense. But then the paper is put online um, and people, any, anybody can go and comment on it and provide feedback and the authors can then answer the feedback or do additional, additional experiments. Um, and that gets at some of the, some of what you're looking for um, I think the other aspect of this, though, is uh, really kind of a separate issue, which is this notion of um, publishing negative results. And I know that's been kicked around several times just in the in the past 10 years um, since I've been paying attention to it. And probably even before that, there's this, this general um, belief, which I think is correct, that people don't publish negative results, that you usually can't publish negative results, but it would actually be informative if others could look and see what hasn't worked, because that could be very useful in planning your project so we don't all go digging down the same holes. Um, and I, I think those are actually two slightly different problems. I think the publication of negative results is something that would have to be handled in a kind of a wiki type of or a, or a forum type of setup, um, whereas the commenting on uh, on work that's maybe not as far along as a traditional publication is is partially implemented at least in Plus One. Yeah, Plus One though you do have to have it <clears throat> peer reviewed and accepted and all of that, so it's more like a traditional journal. There is something called. Plus Currents Influenza, where you can post your manuscripts, and if they're eventually published, that's fine. If not, they're there, and I'll post a link for that. But that's just for influenza. It's not for all of science. What you're talking about is a good idea, but I think it would be very hard to get everyone to participate, because as you said, there's a lot of competition. People don't want to put stuff there that hasn't been published, they will try to publish it one way or another rather than have it go there. I think it's a great idea, but I think implementing it would be different. You know, there are a lot of social network type sites for science, and a lot of those try and do similar things. At least they have, for example, graduate students uh, running discussions about techniques and so forth. But this is all fragmented in too many places, and so that doesn't work. So I don't have a good answer for you. I think the idea is good. I think there are some starts, but not there yet. She asked I, who, who to talk to about getting it started, and I talked to her husband. <laughs> you know? Th this, is, this is the kind of thing, this is the way this kind of stuff starts. Somebody says, you know, we, we need something like this. And the answer is, yeah, we do need, it would be nice to have something like that, where, you know, when you go to do an experiment, you say, I wonder if anybody's done this. Because, as, as Alan says, you don't want to go down the same dark hole uh, again, but there's no there's no good way to find that out now. And uh, with yeah. the internet being what it is, you would think there would be a good way. It's just hard to motivate people to contribute to something like that. I don't know how you motivate it. That's the problem, getting people to contribute uh, on a big level. So, for example, Anna Maria, we have a site called biocrowd.com, which is a kind of a social interaction site for scientists. There are a few thousand people there, and that would be a good platform to do this on. But not everybody goes there. They go to other sites as well. So, you know, I could tell you, sure, 
uh, if your husband wants to code it, we can stick it on BioCrowd, but I'm not sure it would be useful. Yeah, I think the problems here, uh, as your husband pointed out, they're, they're not, um, it's not a technical issue, and I don't think it's a financial issue either. Uh, if you have the content and scientists are going to read it, you can easily pay for that with advertising, which is um, uh, that, that and page charges are how the open access journals operate. So um, there is revenue available to support things like this. The catch is that you have to get the, you have to show that it's uh, reaching a large and specific audience in the first place. Here's an idea for you, Anna Maria. This is cheap. Go to Facebook and start a fan page. Call it something like Science Notes or whatever. And there you can have people post their stuff. They can post links. They can post comments, methods, things that don't work. You will get thousands of people engaged there that's not a bad that's not a bad idea launch it there where you already have uh, a wide subscribership yeah and, and the infrastructure free. is already built it's built it's free and you're guaranteed an audience and if it works and you get a lot of people interested then you can think about the next step right. and you build your own site and uh yeah you could build the site on something like media wiki uh, right. or some other wiki type software that's already been built for you uh, we have one from Don who writes, I just heard a fascinating interview with Barry Marshall on ABC's The Science Show podcast. It seems that he was not content to establish helicobacter as a cause of disease. Now he wants to find, create more benign strains as a way to vaccinate against other microbes. And this, of course, helicobacter pylori, the cause of stomach ulcers, which was shown by Barry Marshall, an Australian scientist. So he put a link to this which we will pass on. P.S. Longtime listener to Twiv and Twip can't get enough. Bravo. Well, thank you, Don. Always nice to get more science content. And another one from James. I saw you had a link to the National Library of Medicine at twiv.tv, so I thought you might want to know about a new biomedical search engine called biomedsearch.com. It contains PubMed, Medline publications, including some data that NIH chooses not to display, plus additional journals and a collection of these of theses and dissertations that are not available for elsewhere for free, making it the most comprehensive biomedical search on the web. So we will put a link to that for anyone who is interested in checking it out. Have you used this? I have not. So I wanted to put it out there and see what people think. Because there, right. there are many, yeah, many new search out. engines now that are coming out there. This is one of them. Um, there are a couple of others, and I thought we would just throw it out. Um, DDA writes, uh, look, uh, dear all, look at the second comment that follows the news of polio eradication, how not to despair. So this is an article from Scientific American, and there's a link to the original article, which is called Polio in Retreat, New Cases Nearly Eliminated Where Virus Once Flourished. And it tells the story of how uh, the number of polio cases in India has gone down significantly this year. And in the article, there are two comments by readers. Uh, one is a positive comment, and the second is from Spoonman WOS, who says, Yes, we might have saved a lot of lives, but how many Indian kids are now autistic? Another win for Big Pharma at the expense of kids. And uh, DDA despairs over this. What should we do? And he's right, because I don't know why Spoonman is saying that autism has anything to do with polio vaccine, but it is in another way that information spreads and or will or read implying this. that vaccines are highly profitable, particularly yes. polio vaccine. Which it is not, yes. I was walking, I took the grandkids to the park today. This may not seem relevant, but I think it is. I took the grandkids to the park today, and on the way out, they got trash containers all over the place. And in every place, they got one big barrel for trash and another barrel next to it with a more restricted top uh, for plastic bottles and cans, right? And just for kicks, I looked into all these. And there were half, it says, big red letters, no garbage. And in half of them, uh, in all of them, they were half filled with garbage. And I thought to myself, how are we ever going to get anywhere <laughs> when the human race behaves like this, okay? You, get, you, you have this opportunity to do the right thing, and what do you do? You throw garbage in it. So... I don't know. Just think how many kids are <laughs> saved by this vaccine. It has nothing to do with autism. I don't know what... This is not true, Spoon Man. It's wrong. You should know right. better. 
But the two most common elements in the universe are hydrogen and stupidity, not necessarily in that order. Don't throw garbage in the recycling bin. Yes. <laughs> Who said the uh, the hydrogen one, Alan? I don't know. I, I <laughs> okay. Let's do a few picks of the week in this last day of 2010. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I have something that was sent by one of our uh, virology colleagues, Kathy Spindler, at the University of Michigan. She says she writes to both you and me, Vincent, but I grabbed this one uh, because you get all these write-in picks, and I'm, my pick list is <laughs> i got to scrape around myself for these. No problem. She said, this ought to be a science pick of the week, one for you, uh, and it's uh, a link to a fantastic publication by the uh, Royal Society. Let me uh, get this. Uh, it's Biology Letters, a publication of the Royal Society, which the Royal Society is a, uh, a British uh, organization, science organization. I guess it's kind of like the National, uh, National Academy in the U.S. Is that right? At any rate, this is uh, their publication, and it's a publication of a piece of work that was done by a group of school kids. This is particularly relevant because we've had so many conversations here about uh, how to educate people in science. Uh, and so there was a, a researcher who um, is, does a lot of uh, work with bees who got together with a couple of classes of kids, 25, 8 to 10-year-old children, and of course uh, in collaboration with the, the teachers uh, from this school. Uh, the school's in a, an English town called uh, Blackerton. And it's a study of memory in bees. Now, obviously, the person directing this had a lot of insight into this and helped with the problem and the apparatus, but engaged the kids uh, really well. And they uh, gave the bees uh, a, uh, a pattern recognition challenge. They have an apparatus that has uh, a, a big squares that have patterns of colored, colored patterns of circles on them. And they train the bees to go after certain patterns where there's sugar and then ask questions you by switching around the patterns of stuff as to how the bees recognize the patterns. I can't go into it in detail here. It's just too complicated. But the important thing is that they had the kids write the paper. And so the illustrations in the paper are hand-drawn illustrations by the kids. The tables have the kids' handwriting filling in the, in the tables. And the way they wrote the paper was that this researcher interviewed the kids and got their reactions, you know, asked them apparently leading questions and stuff and got their reactions and then transcribed it as best that uh, he could and submitted it to the journal and to the Credit of the journal, they took this whole thing and published it. This is a first-rate journal, and it's a fascinating article. Great experiment in uh, education, and um, uh, actually a really interesting experiment in general. It's very cool. It's That's great. awesome. It's just great. It's exactly what we've been talking about, getting kids engaged in science. And he makes it a game. Uh, he, he, teaches, he teaches kids that um, science is is game playing and uh, you're playing games with nature among other things changing the rules on nature and seeing how nature responds right. that's the way you do experiments and uh it's a it's a great little nice pick. thank you kathy yeah excellent alan uh well first of all uh harlan ellison is the one with who said the hydrogen and stupidity um comment uh, the sci-fi uh, writer yes excellent so uh, I knew I'd seen it somewhere and, and remembered it. But uh, the, uh, my pick of the week is not Harlan Ellison. It's uh, the official U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service blog on white nose syndrome in bats. Um, and uh, it's not a, an incredibly active blog. Uh, they had two posts in December um, and uh, you know, one in November. But uh, some neat material on here, and they also have a Flickr photo stream that has some very cool shots of bats in caves and uh, with and without white nose syndrome um, and some good, uh, some good discussion of what's going on with the research and uh, um, you know, kind of what they're looking at at this point. And obviously, this has been a recurring topic uh, here on TWIV 
uh, with our enduring fascination with bats. Um, and so I stumbled across this blog and uh, thought our listeners might enjoy it. They are very socially connected. They have a Flickr they page. They are, yes. Twitter. They just announced, they just announced uh, their Facebook, Twitter, and Flickr uh, accounts. Nice. Very good. Well, there well you go. once again, too, I looked at this, and once again, relevant to our thing about science education, one of their recent posts titled, Who Cares About West Nile Syndrome, that you see that, on the yes. their front page, is a blog from a ninth grader who yep. did a report on white nose syndrome and apparently came up with uh, a bunch of new perspective on it. If you read this kid's blog, I can't believe it's a ninth grader. It's so yeah. well written. Uh, it's amazing. Yeah, Very she's going to go far. Nice. Yes. Great. All right, my pick is a article by Kim McCleary, who's the president and CEO of the CFIDS Association of America. It is called Headway Headlines and Healthy Skepticism. It's a summary of what's gone on with XMRV in December of 2010. So it has a nice summary of the FDA Blood Products Advisory Committee meeting with some good links uh, to presentations there. They have a summary. She has a summary of the four papers published last week and the brouhaha surrounding them and some words on what to expect for 2011. An excellent, excellent summary. Yeah, she does a really nice job. Really well done, Kim. Good mm -hmm. job. And uh, thanks for doing that. And I think everyone will will enjoy reading this uh, and following some of the links to see what's going on. So that is my pick of the week. And that's my last pick of 2010, as it is for my two colleagues as well. Yep. Please do go to our fan page on Facebook, facebook.com slash thisweekinvirology. I post things there and pictures. You can get to know us a little bit better uh, over on Facebook. We have lots of fans there. There are many ways to listen to TWIV at iTunes, the Zoom Marketplace, or at TWIV.tv. And you can use the Microbe World app to listen on your iPhone, iApp, sorry, your iPhone, iPad, iUniverse, or there's also one available for Android devices as well. As always, send us your questions and comments to TWIV at twiv.tv. Alan Dove is at alandove.com. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. Rich Condit is at the University of Florida Gainesville. Thanks, Rich. You're quite welcome. It's uh, been a wonderful year. I look forward to more like it. Yes, thank you very much for doing this for the past year, 50 episodes. Your presence is essential, of course. Well, actually, I was thinking earlier as we were doing this, uh, I want to thank TWIV. I can't believe how much I've learned from this and Excellent. how much it's added to, you know, my life and my career and my perspective on science and virology. It's been great. And the and the the listeners who write in have added to all that. It's just a great experience for everybody. Absolutely. It's a unique place in the universe, that's for sure. And yes, I thank everybody as well. I'm Vincent Racaniello. I'm at virology.ws. Stay with us in 2011 if you want to keep up with virology. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.